2023 preseason is officially underway, and with that has come plenty of talk as the team continues to prepare and mold its roster. Hello everybody, welcome back to Miami Total Football Radio, where the beautiful game collides with passion and analysis. My name is Franco Penizo. I am one of your hosts of this bilingual Inter-Miami-focused podcast, which provides you all the latest news, updates, analysis, opinions, inside information, general punditry, and much, much more via a team of seasoned reporters. We also go by the name of Miami Total Football Radio, and I can also be known as Franco Paniso. Joining me in whatever language you would like to say their names in are two of my usual three fellow co-hosts, and they are Jose Armando, alias or alias, Island Jose, and Andrea Yanis, a.k.a. Ajicita. Jose, we will start with you on this week's podcast because... Well, I don't know why, but just because. And preseason has officially begun, so we got our feet wet a little bit on Monday. Had our first day back in with uh, viewing the team from up close. So, first off, how are you doing? And second of all, how happy are you to be officially back underway with the team returning to practice? Oh, I'm doing really, really good and happy to be with you all again. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, the excitement, um, you know, of, of the start of preseason, it, it I think we say it every year, but, you know, it's like the first day of school, getting back into the rhythm of things, press conference, um, you know, the the media availability this year, the first day, I'd say, was, was good because we were able to talk to players on the field right after practice, and then we had a press conference, so we had, we had quite a good number of players talking to us, um, except the one that we really wanted, <laughs> we really wanted but I'm going to leave that for later. But, um, yeah, I know. Just really, really excited to get back to things. Andreita. Ajisita. Welcome back to your first pod of Miami Total Football Radio in 2023. Since you missed last week's show with uh, Steven Primo Brenner, who's not on this week. But, first off, how was your New Year's? Happy 2023, Andrea. And what did you think of the first day of 2023 preseason? Happy New Year, happy 2023 to you guys. I'm glad to be back on the podcast. I'm glad to be back covering uh, football. Man, I missed it, even though if I was not as happy with Inter Miami last year, um, I really missed uh, having uh, football to watch um, live. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be back. I really, I was really happy to be back in training because... Um, Football is the best sport in the world, and I uh, love covering it, and I love seeing you guys and seeing everyone, the players, and and everything new, and uh, to come back uh, with Inter Miami and the dreams and the realities and all that entitles being (laughs) a reporter that covers this team. (laughs) But you said you were not happy with Inter Miami last year. Um, I'm thinking now, are you going to be happy... (laughs) <laughs> Inter Miami 2023. That's my question to you. Well, let's see. That is why we have this podcast to talk today, right? I think uh, maybe uh, this year will be different. Maybe who knows? We have a lot to talk about, uh, but it, it it seems exciting. No, it's in it, it, it. People are excited right now, but as I said, things are positive now. Let's see. Let's way for reality so we will always be here Miami Total Football Radio team will always be here to tell you the truth and to tell it how it is decirlo como es as we say <laughs> there we go there we go so yeah actually Andrea did say a couple things there that, that you know I'd like to dissect a little bit or, or dive into a little bit more or com- compound on and that is that it does feel like the first day of school at preseason right like you know you see all your familiar faces again not not only you're talking about the team and the returning players but just the people that work in and around the team that we work with on a day-to-day, including, you know, the media corps were, for the most part, a, a tight-knit, smaller group of individuals that consistently go. So it's it's nice to see everybody make some jokes, uh, talk about the holidays, and then just get ready for another year. And it's going to be a busy year because there's a lot of games on the schedule for Inter Miami. But we can get up to all that later because we've got a lot to talk about. We've already got a lot to talk about in only one day. We have to provide our observations from day one of Inter Miami practice. We've got to talk about the Joseph Martinez reports because it looks like the Venezuelan is headed to South Florida. We need to talk about Rodolfo Pizarro, Alejandro Pozuelo, 
Robbie Robinson, Ariel Lassiter, and, well, some of the remarks made in the post-practice press conferences. So, a lot to talk about. Let's not you waste any more. Name. Who did I forget? Campana. Oh, we, yes. We also <laughs> will be talking about Leonardo Campana. There's, a, there's so many names. You know, see, if I try to fit them all into the intro, then we're going to miss our desired target of like an hour runtime. An hour to an hour and 10 is what we're gunning for in 2023. We got to an hour and seven last week, so I think we did fairly well. So uh, let's try to keep it in that frame. So a lot to talk about. Let's get to it. All right, so as we just discussed, Inter-Miami's 2023 preseason is underway. Inter-Miami had the first day of practice on Monday, January 9th. And it was, again, a, a nice day. It was a very breezy day. The weather was pretty good in, on Monday morning. And no, no rain, nothing like that. It was a little, I won't say chilly, but it was it was fresh. It was a fresh morning. It wasn't overly hot, overly humid. Uh, and a good first day back, I think, overall. Now, I will provide very quick updates on four players before we dive into the bigger talking points here. And those four players are Ian Frey, Jean Mota, DeAndre Yedlin, and Leonardo Campana, as Andrea so uh, rightly reminded me of just a few moments ago. So, Ian Frey... And was inside doing non, non-ball non work in the gym. So he was on the bike, he was doing different things. He's still working his way back from the knee injury he suffered last preseason. They're, they're being extra cautious with him. Jean Mota has a groin injury of sorts that he's working back from. He did some work on the field when we initially walked in. Uh, and he was doing work with a personal trainer, or a physio, excuse me. And then he went back to the gym. DeAndre Yedlin... He popped out onto the field after the rest of the team. He was doing some bike work, stationary bike work, while the team was out on the field. And then he came out and did some running drills. He's on a different timeline post-World Cup um, than the rest of the team, just because his vacation didn't start until later. So I assume they're giving him um, some time to work his way back into fitness in that sense. And then Campana, Leonardo Campana, we were told by team staff that Campana is sick or that he was sick and he was dealing with an illness and that's why he was not available on Monday. So four quick updates. Besides that, pretty much everyone else that we know about was in attendance except the new signing, which we will get to a little bit later on. Very quickly, guys, very quickly. Your biggest impression of day one, because it it felt, yes, it's like Andrea also said, earlier it, it was very positive right you know it's like the first day back in school everyone's all smiles there's no there's no real pressure yet on day one um so it, it's all happiness for the most part quick impressions just about what you saw from the team because this is a continuation right there's not a whole lot of changes that have been made to the roster this is just a continuation of 2022 in terms of the roster there will be pieces added in we expect but for the most part, it's the same group with the same overall vibe and Phil Neville leading the charge. So just any quick takeaways you have overall, either about the four players that I just mentioned or just the overall day. Uh, Andrea. Well, it was, a, it was a surprise not seeing Campana there because we were all, all expecting expecting him, uh, expecting to see him train, looking forward to see him train on Thursday or on Monday. Uh, we haven't been told when he will be back, but it, it was a surprise not seeing him there. I think uh, the positive notes for me f- were watching Pizarro, watching him with his teammates. Um, I can really tell that um, the Latino guys like Pizarro uh, by w- how they were training and how were were interacting between themselves. Then uh, also we saw Corinton John that um, was looking sharp. So hopefully we get to see him this year and um, and get to know his game and, and to know how he will fit in this team. Uh, and I really like also that I saw guys like Robert Taylor, Damian Lowe, and uh, McVeigh looking uh, good physically. All of them, all the players look good physically. I like, I, I really like that. But for me, the highlight was watching Pizarro, to tell you the truth. So Rodolfo Pizarro is back in. Rodolfo Pizarro is yeah. back in with the group for the first time since 2021. We will dive into that in more detail. A little bit later on in the podcast. I actually, before I go to Jose, I will update you guys or provide you with some information that I have not told you yet. 
um, that I found out afterwards. And, and I was doing some digging, gathering my information, talking to sources. And you know how we were expected to... I forget what time it exactly was. You guys can remind me. What time were we supposed to start watching training? 10.15, correct? Yes. Okay. 10.15. And, and, we, and we didn't get in there until what? Roughly. Almost 10, 30, 11. 35, I think. Yeah, almost 10, 40 or almost 11 or something like that. So, Jose, what time did you say? 10.35. 10.35. So the reason, from what I've gathered, that we were not let in to training during those opening minutes, even though we could hear that there was stuff going on in the background, and you can see even through the, the black tarps that there was some pink shirts running about, is because Inter Miami was doing its preseason beep test, so that's why we were not allowed in there for the first twenty minutes. Because what well, if you're unfamiliar with what a beep test is? Well, it's done to measure which of the players, you know, what their how do you say this? Their aerobic capacity is. Um, I, I don't know all the details of how Inter Miami performed their beep test. Some people do it on a treadmill. Some people do it outdoors. Inter Miami did it outdoors, but essentially to see who can last the longest in terms of running a whole bunch of sprints and, and things of that nature. Who can make it to the end? So that's what Inter Miami was doing, you guys, while we were out there curious as to why we weren't let in at 10.15 like we saw on the schedule while ahead we, of time. While we were out there toasting. Toasting. <laughs> toasting? It was nice out, Andre. What are you talking about? Jose, your quick, your quick thoughts on just day one. And now that you know it was a beep test, you know, does that, does that make it more acceptable that you were waiting? Or would you have liked to seen the beep test? Because I guess I can understand them not wanting to, you know, single out some players that may be not doing so well in the beep test. So you want, you, you want them to hide who finished last, basically, because that's what they were trying to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but right. I well, yes. Well, I mean, I'm not <laughs> saying that, you know, that's okay, but I can understand why they, you know, they, they would do that. I can understand that. Well, you know, it doesn't mean, abs- I mean, it, what does it really mean to finish last in the beep test? I mean, does that make you the worst player on the team? Absolutely not. But uh, I'm I'm gonna be peaceful in the first pod of preseason. Just just give me time. Um, I think you know I I think it, it, you 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 mentioned you said the right word continuation. It felt it felt like a 2022 training because um, unfortunately, other than Pizarro, there was like no star power within the team it it felt like the same it felt like you know same faces everybody's back um uh i especially in the first day we didn't get to see much i think the the first day of of preseason in 2022 were able to see a little bit more because they Mm -hmm. were making another type of drills you know more team oriented in terms of um they were you know, they were playing um, a bit more they were playing a bit uh-huh. more yeah they were playing and, and this year it was you know, just that like uh right yeah just a, it was nothing it was nothing nothing you can get out of it so Pick, um, picking up where they yeah. left off essentially just going through some some basic routine day one drills not not a whole lot of like you know uh, 6v6 7v7s nothing like that where you can really start to see some individual performances we just saw some drills where they were touching passing trying to move you know things like that but not nothing to uh i okay. i catch it yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 i i think i thought it was just a, like normal you know training session from last year so you know hopefully they pick 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 it up a little bit in the next uh, week or so and then we're able to um bring some more insight in terms of, you know, how teams are communicating or what the combinations are in certain parts of the field. Uh, we can see the teams obviously shaping up tactically. That's we something won't that we're see that. Later. We never see it. No, no. but I mean, you, can, you, can, you can get a sense. You can get a sense. I think we did that in the, in the first day of preseason in 2022. So we were not able to do that this year. But um, overall, you know, I, I did expect a little bit different from Pizarro, to be honest. Like, you know, I, I expected to, to see something different from him physically. I'm not saying that he's out of shape. No, no way. I'm not saying that because he's in, in very good shape. But, you know, sometimes when you get an opportunity, a second chance, you do something different. And um, he seemed to me like the same player that left, same player came back. Oof. 
Oof. You get, I, it's only been day one. They're easing themselves okay, back into yeah, it. Yeah, you're, you're like, You're going what? in hard, Jose. Yeah, I think you're trying to take Andrea's nickname from her in 2023 because, yeah. oof, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting... I'm very interesting. <laughs> I, but, uh, vos me las captaste al inicio. You, you got it. I threw a little bit uh, of darts when I came introduce myself but you got them but we're gonna talk I'm very about, perceptive. about them i'm very yeah. perceptive Andrea. <laughs> you, you got them so we're gonna talk about them but jose yeah, and and dos, Andrea, yeah jose, jose is coming up with like two-footed slide tackling studs up looking for the red card maybe even alejandro pozuelo style studs up into andres reyes's chest like last year in the Miami <laughs> versus new york red Bulls. okay well let's quickly quickly because again, trying to keep this within a good time frame here. Let's quickly go into what I think is the biggest takeaway. I think you guys agree it's the biggest takeaway from day one in preseason. Although there are a lot of nuggets and pieces of news to talk about. So let's start with the designated player situation. Because I wrote something today for Miami Total Football Substack. If you have not checked that out yet, please do so. Substack.miamitotalfootball.com It's free to subscribe. We will not charge you. I would never charge you for the content. Just give us a follow there. But anyway, I wrote a story about the designated player situation because it's a bit murky. And, you know, when it comes to Miami and DPs, it's not the first time that there's been some lack of clarity there. So is Gregory a DP? That's one of the biggest questions because we know Rodolfo Pizarro is a DP. We are under the assumption that Leonardo Campana is a designated player. Although... We have not been officially told as much. You know, Chris Henderson said when we spoke to him at the end of 2022 in the end of your press conference that, yes, they were buying out or they were using the buy option in Leonardo Campana's loan deal from Wolves and that he would very likely be a DP. But that has never been officially communicated by the team. So is Campana a DP? Unsure. Is Gregory a DP? There's rumors in recent weeks, or there have been rumors in recent weeks, that he is. Both Phil Neville and Gregory said they did not know anything about that situation when asked directly on Monday during their press conferences. So there's a lot, a lot to, you know, decipher there. Jose, I'll go to you because you you asked Gregory about his status, his contract status or his roster designation. What do you make of it all? What do you make? We'll, we'll dive into what was actually said here in a little bit more detail. But what do you just make of it all as of right now, as of one day into preseason? Well, you know, I, I, I what Gregory said is that, you know, he was not, not aware of of, uh, of the situation. And um, then you ask him again later on in the press conference. And then he added a little bit more information in terms of, you know, what what the timeline is for him when it comes to contract talks with his agents and, and, and he basically said that you know he waits until that the last minute where, when it's time to make a decision then he ha- he he's able to have that conversation just to you know to be a little bit more concentrated to, to keep an ease of mind in terms of okay I'm in preseason right now and that's my main focus so I can believe that from a player but what I cannot believe is what Phil answered when you asked him about <laughs> <laughs> and Phil, hey, and Phil did try to avoid the question, right? Like he avoided it, like it was a slight tackle coming in from a big bad center back. Because he just, yeah, at first he's like, Gregory's my captain, and you know, he like, I was like, in my head, I was like, that wasn't even the question. I, I'm just asking you if he's a designated player, but like he just clearly he was trying to dodge the question. I followed up, and then he he gave the answer that he does not know, which I can't believe. Halston, do you believe that? It's hard to believe. No, there's no way he does not know the roster designation of one of his leaders in the locker room and one of his starters. No, and his captain. No way. No way. And Impossible. And his captain, yes. Of course. I think Gregory is a designated player because of his salary. And if he's not made a designated player, then Inter Miami would be looking at uh, more sanctions in a couple of years, next year, or whatever. And they can they don't have the luxury to do that again. But what bothers me is that we have all these questions and we ask them because we ask this question to Gregory to Phil. Then we ask about Campana and we don't get answers. We don't get clear answers. So um, it's a little bit disappointing because we, we then have to speculate, but our experience tells us he 
should be a designated player because if he's going to make all that money, he should be a designated player because if not, they will be breaking the rules again. So I don't think they'll be breaking the rules. I think, I think that, you know, listen, they have time yeah. before the, before the roster is, is due to MLS. So I don't think they're going to break the rules. I think they've learned their lesson there. I also don't agree with you necessarily, Andrea, that, you know, it's disappointing. I think it's par for the course. They're not going to say everything in a transparent way. It's just not the way the professional sports works, especially not in 2023 when uh, media access has become less, uh, individual team uh, messaging and uh, media coverage of itself. You know, leagues cover themselves now. Teams cover themselves, uh, if you can say cover. You know, they produce their own packages, their own, you know, things to social media. So, like, I don't think it's disappointing. I think it's just standard. And I think that's where now we, as the seasoned reporters that we are, now we have to do our jobs and dig and find the information and and bring to light what's actually going on. This is what I will say, because I don't have inside information besides what is, is out there already. But I would say this. I think, and I agree with you here, Ajisita, that Gregory is a designated player. Because if he was not a designated player, then the answer is very easy, very simple from Phil Neville. It's, yeah, he's, yeah. Not, a, he's not a designated player. No. And uh-huh. it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? Like, if you asked Phil Neville, hey, is Christopher McVeigh a designated player? He'd probably say no. If you ask him, hey, is Edison Ascona a designated player? He probably says no. It's pretty straightforward. The fact that he had to be like, I don't know, I think that that, that shows right. that there is some truth from my, from what I perceive, from what I, my reading in between the lines is that Gregory is a designated player, or, and that that has made things much more complicated. Because if Gregory and Rodolfo Pizarro are two of your three DPs, and again, let's just say for now, Campana is not, although he very well could be, then that leaves you with only one slot left to fill it with one big offseason signing, one big impact player that can help try to make the difference. Uh, in terms of what the team has lost with Gonzalo Higuain's retirement. So, anyway, Jose, sorry, we both cut you off there. Continue on with your remarks. No, no, what I, what I was trying to say is that, you know, the perfect example comes within the same press conference from Phil when Andrea asked Phil about Leonardo Campana, is he's part of this team? And then he immediately said, like, yes, he is part of this team. Yeah, I asked it. him if he had a contract signed, yeah. He, he yeah. said, yes, so he, is, he said yes, he is an Inter-Miami yes. player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I so I mean, if Gregory is not a designated player, then just go ahead and say yeah, no. Exactly, but, I mean, that is why just, I was telling Franco yeah. I'm disappointed because <laughs> but you, why I, is all this mystery, but man? You get, of, of, because you, seriously, because I'm sure they're negotiating. I'm sure that you know they're trying to be careful with what they say publicly yeah. because when they're negotiating with the agent and with Gregory and they're trying to see if they can get his cap hit lower. I mean, that's why I asked the question to Gregory the way that I did. I asked him because Jose, you went straight in. First question of Gregory's press conference: Hey, are you a DP? And Gregory's like, "What? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about." I I went about it a little bit differently. I said, "You know, obviously, and and, and this is true." And the, and his response was kind of cliched, but I was trying to see if he would give us something, and he did give us something. Because players will say that they just focus on the field, they just focus on their job, they let the rep, you know, their their agents, los representantes, uh, you know figure out the contract stuff and and all this you know it's, it's a common saying it's a common remark when it's made publicly but that's really 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 maybe barring some exceptions not true because if a team is approaching an agent okay sure the agent is going to do his job and try to figure out what works and what doesn't work but he has to run it through the player he like very few occasions is there are there agents out there that will just be able to go and do whatever the heck they want without approval from their age, from their player, right? From the person that they're representing. There's just, there's no way. He'd have to be like, hey, look, this is what the team's presenting. It's, well, it depends. Now, the player's uh, involvement could be minimal. It could be a lot. It just depends. But there's got to be some involvement to give the heads up, the thumbs up, the yes, the okay, the whatever. All right, I'll will agree to this. No, I want this. Like that, that, that conversation has to happen between agent and player at some point. And Gregory said he's focusing on the field, focusing on work, working hard, you know, getting back into the groove in preseason. But he did say, as players, you always want a better contract. He said that. So you can read into that what you would like. You can make of it what you would like. If you take things at face value in press conferences all the time, then... I mean, I think you have to pick and choose. I think you have to pick and choose 
you know, and it's just based on your sense as a, as a as a media member or as a person that's listening to it all. What you, when you think someone's being honest and when someone's not being honest, because it's not always about what's what's said in a press conference. Sometimes it's about what's not said. And in this case with Phil Neville, not saying directly that Gregory is not a DP, I think then you Please. can you can make your your own conclusions there. I'm gonna I, I... end this up telling something. I think that the team is not. Because they like all this messy talk that Messi is going to come and Messi is going to come. And if they have already their DPs, he cannot come. So maybe the team doesn't want that talk to end or something like that. And that is why they don't reveal that information. Well, but that but that would end in, in, in two weeks or so. Yeah. So if that's, if that's the case, I mean, that the talk is going to be just for two weeks. Bottom line here, guys, you know, I think Gregory shouldn't be a designated player. Uh, I mean, honestly, I think, you know, he's a, he's been a good player for the team, the captain, but when you put the designated player label on a person, I, I don't think Gregory right now fits, fits, fits the profile, just to be honest. No, yeah, he's definitely, I mean, he's definitely, definitely not worthy of being a DP, no, no doubt. No. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that's, that's the bigger problem here. That's the bigger problem because, you know, we'll get the information if, if indeed he's a designated player. We'll get it shortly because they, they have to... Uh, follow the rules, Around, and that's going to yeah. happen. Some uh, that's going to happen sometime bef before the first game. So we're going to find out, and and if that's the case, you know that there's something to talk there in terms of you know the contract situation with some of the players in in Inter Miami. Um, you know, the, there's some blame in there because you know obviously this is a situation that um, just like Pizarro, they don't want to have. They didn't want to have Pizarro as a designated player this year. They wanted to find another place for him. And then you come into the first day of preseason, and here's here we are again talking about a player that you really don't want as a designated player, but uh, you're going to, you know, find a way to to handle the situation in terms of Gregory and Pizarro being with the team this year. So you know, it's it's unfortunate. Again, to me, it's it's crazy, and I and I and we were talking about this, Franco. You know, every year, every year, there's something with Inter Miami. <laughs> That's what makes it one of the most appealing and fascinating teams. Uh, to cover, to follow, and I'm sure for the supporters to be a fan of, because you know that you never know what's coming next. You never know. I will say this because you know sometimes, sometimes I have to tell myself, like Miami Total Football Radio is not just being listened to by people that follow us on Twitter. There are people that don't have Twitter that listen to the show and may not know this. So I will state something that has been out on Twitter for a few weeks that I have heard as of late is is a real thing and something that I think is not a small factor in all of this. I think it does it is partially connected. Inter Miami, from what I hear, is seriously after or looking at Sergio Busquets. That they want Sergio Busquets. If you bring Sergio Busquets or if you're trying to bring Sergio Busquets this summer which is what I've heard that, you know, is, is part of the hope. And I don't know if you have space for Gregory longer term on this team because you can't, I don't think you can fit Busquets, Gene Mota, and Gregory in that midfield. I don't think so. I don't think so. But anyway, uh, something to consider here in the overall bigger picture of, of Gregory and, you know, his contract situation, whether he's a DP, you know, what kind of future he could have with his team. I mean, because, Jose, you said it, you said it, I think, correctly. Gregory does not deserve to be a DP, or he should not be a DP. Because, first of all, the DPs in MLS normally are attacking players. Second of all, even, you know, there are exceptions here and there. I don't think his play has merited DP-level status, right? In MLS, you need to make sure that you, to, to try to really give yourself the best chance of winning or, or to making uh, some very big noise, you've got to try to max your 3DP signings. You've got to try to hit on all three of them, make sure that they're delivering and performing at a high level consistently. If you can do that, you give yourself a very good shot at winning an MLS. And Gregory's performances, look, in 2021, he was a team MVP. You know, it was his first season and he showed a lot and he earned the captaincy. Last year, I still think he put in a lot of effort, but I don't think his performance levels were as good. I don't think they were as good. I don't think he he impacted the game consistently as much. He didn't have as much of an influence. I think part of that is due to the positioning of Gregory from Phil Neville, right? Because when the year started, it was Gregory as the six, Gene Mota as the eight. They played side by side. It wasn't really working. So, you know, eventually 
Phil Neville settled on Gene Mota being the six to help distribute, even though he's not a true defensive midfielder, to try to make him more of a deep-lying playmaker. And then Gregory was more advanced up the field in an eight role, but clearly his strengths are not going forward. So uh, I think maybe that played a part in, in his performance levels dropping. But nonetheless, you know, if, if the piece doesn't fit in a league like MLS where you have only a certain amount of money, then, you know, maybe that... That could be a, a sign that his future is in South Florida might not be that for that much longer. Though he may not have much of a future here with the team. Anyway, let's move on because you guys touched on it. And I think it's something that the listeners want to hear about. And that's Rodolfo Pizarro. He's back with the team for the first time since 2021. He spent all of 2022 on loan at Monterrey. He's back for what Phil Neville said in the press conference. He said this and I was surprised he said this and how he said it. Rodolfo Pizarro's final year with Inter Miami. Now, maybe he meant the final year of his contract. This is the last year of his deal. But he said the final year, which, again, you can read between the lines. And I would say, look, I mean, based on everything we know, unless Pizarro has an absolute monster year this year, assuming he stays, I, you know, I, I think this will be the last time you see Pizarro in the pink and black of Inter Miami. But anyway, yeah, we saw him there on the field. Full Novo talked about Pizarro having a, a new attitude and a new demeanor. And, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think Pizarro will be on this roster on day one of the regular season, Jose? I would say yes. Right now, I would say yes, just because, you know, the prize, um, just like, you know, Steve reported in in the last spot, 3.5 million for Pizarro. I think that's too high. And, um I don't see in a scenario in which, you know, a team will take that within MLS, and I don't think they will do that in Mexico as well. There were reports late last year that Chivas was thinking about it, but Fernando Hierro said no. Um, he didn't fit the plan there. So, you know, he's still under contract, and I think, you know, his it, it, he, he looks like, you know, he's, he's okay with being here, you know, and, and taking the opportunity this year. Maybe raising the level a little bit without Iguain around, making it his team. Um, I just, I just, I think there's no way, or, or little chance, I should say, of of Pizarro leaving at this point. Andrea, do you think Pizarro is here for day one of the regular season? If you had to bet on it, Ajisita, is Rodolfo Pizarro in the? I won't say the match day roster. Is he on Inter Miami's official roster on day one of the regular season? Yes, I think he will be. Um, what, well, what Jose said, uh, um, teams in Mexico are already playing games. They are in the season and, and they will be in the season. I know player, players can still come, but e- either it was Monterrey or it was Chivas and it didn't go well for him in Monterrey and, uh, because they didn't want to buy him and Chivas new manage new management didn't want to make that investment. So I think he... He has decided to come and give it a shot in in this Inter Miami now um, because he doesn't want, he doesn't want to lose money, I guess. And second, he wants to play. So uh, this league could give him an opportunity to play, to get back to the level that we once uh, saw in him. So I think, yes, he would be in the roster, especially because of that. I could see it going both ways. I could see it going where he, and I'm hedging my bets here. I'm sitting on the fence. Um, but I, I could see it going either way because I, I, it's clear to me that the team does not want him. It's clear to me. Like I don't know if you guys came in with the same perception after Monday, but it's clear to me that the team does not want him. Even Phil Neville was like, "Oh, Pizarro will will have to, you know, uh, pl- you know, earn earn a spot in that midfield." And he like said the likes of Bryce Duke, uh, Gregory, Gene Mota. He's got a Robert Taylor. He's got to compete for a spot in that midfield. He, he named a bunch of players and said. It's like, so he's saying, which, you know, I can also get from a motivational standpoint, like Pizarro is not a guaranteed starter. And then, but then Pizarro, uh, when uh, Phil Neville was asked about Pozuelo and Alejandro Pozuelo's future with this team, he brought up Pizarro again. And he said, you know, it's a jigsaw puzzle with Pizarro and Pozuelo. And so to me, I don't think they want Pizarro. I think if they can find a way to move him on without having to take that hit of $3.5 million, then they would do so. Can they oh, find yeah. someone at that price? That. Are they going to be able to find someone at that price before the start of the season? That's the challenge. That's what Chris Henderson, I'm sure, is working arduously at. But 
If he can't, then he's going to be on the roster. Unless Jorge Mas, Jose Mas give the thumbs up to buy out his contract and use the one-time buyout on Rodolfo Pizarro. Other than that, he's. I think he'll be here. And if he's here, then, just to be clear, because I, I've seen some different things on, on social media from, from different fans, I don't think Pozuelo comes back. If Pizarro's yeah. here, P- Pozuelo's not coming back. That's my that's my understanding. Yeah. And I've, I've also heard Pozuelo has been dealing with some personal issues that could impact his decision, but I've heard Pozuelo wants DP money. Now, we've already just talked about the fact that Inter Miami may have one, potentially none, or maybe two, just depending on however you perceive things, uh, DP slots available. So, if the Pozuelo indeed wants DP money, and that is what I'm hearing, then clearly Inter Miami is going to have to make a tough decision because you can't. Ha- I don't think you can have Pozuelo and Pizarro both on your roster. They both serve similar no, I- functions, and you can't have two no. ten DPs right in MLS. Like they just. It's just almost unthinkable, right? You have you have to have players that can defend. You need that that balance, and I don't think you can have that balance with Pizarro and Pozuelo uh, both on the field. And I would like to add one more thing to that. You know, it's not the absolute worst if Pizarro stays and he's able to get back to, you know, the the Pizarro the um that that played for Monterrey before arriving to Inter Miami. Pizarro is, is he's a good player. There's 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 quality in him, but you know, to me it seems and, like it's maybe mentally a situation in which you know he commits to this team and um, and he believes he can be a leader for this team. And if you combine Pizarro, Lassiter on the left side, maybe Coco on the right side, and Campana at the top, that's not a bad situation. I mean, I'm not saying that yeah. they're going to win a championship, but it's going to be exciting to watch. It will, yeah, exactly. But also, he needs to adjust. He needs to adjust to playing as a ten and be responsible playing as a ten in terms of you know pressure and some other things that we're going to talk later within the season. <laughs> but I think there's there's potential there. There's potential there if the right mindset is in place. So for both of you, really quickly, just yes or no. Do you agree with me? Is that also your sense? And if it's not, then I'll ask you why. You can dive into it. Uh, do you agree with me that you think the only way Pozuelo returns to Inter Miami is if Pizarro is gone? Do you agree with that that notion, that sentiment? Yes. Yes, 100%. Okay. All right. So all three of us are in agreement there. And Jose, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not buying into... You know, I, I'm not going to say Pizarro is terrible because he does have quality to him. You're right about that. But I don't know if we're going to see that from him in this group. I just clearly, like, and we talked about this last week, so we don't have to go into into it in, in good detail. But his career has been on a decline since he joined Inter Miami in, in, back in 2020. So could he have a renaissance year? Possibly. Well, but he would have to be the guy. He I would have like that's the thing I no, think about No, I think about he Pizarro. has more quality. He has more quality now because before it was only him, Iwain and Luis Morgan. But now Inter Miami has options and and attack and uh, players that are gifted that can touch the ball in Ariel Lassiter, in Leonardo Campana, in Robert Taylor, in even Emerson. So player when you have players like that, it's easier for them to play together. But I think you were talking individually, right? I mean in Individually, I think yeah, there's that there. But yeah. I would say this. I would say this, guys. I would put Pizarro in the same position alongside Joseph Martinez. If Martinez is able to sign with Inter Miami, which it looks like is going to happen. Because everybody gets excited about Martinez. But if you look back into last year, then there's no reason to get excited. Same situation for Rodolfo Pizarro. So when you're getting excited about Martinez, you're thinking about the Martinez that won championships in MLS. So the same thing could could be said about Pizarro. You can get excited about Pizarro, but you have to think back to the Pizarro that played for Monterrey before coming to Inter Miami. And how long ago was that? A long time ago, like three years. Exactly. exactly. And three years in football is a lifetime. Is a lifetime. Martinez, though. Uh, uh, we'll we'll get to Joseph. We will get to Joseph Martinez in a second. We will get to... T- don't don't jump the gun there, Jose. We will get there. We will get there. I don't, I don't disagree with your overall premise, but we will get there. With Pizarro, to me, to me, to help round out my thought at least, 
I think he has to feel like he is the guy. If he feels like he's the guy, then maybe you'll see him succeed. Is he the guy? Is that is Inter Miami going to make him feel like he's the guy? Is that what Phil Neville is going to do? I have a hard time seeing that. I have a hard time seeing that. And I, and I have a hard time seeing Pizarro deliver consistently at a DP level if he does stay. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe at the end of the year, he ended up performing very well. I but. can see I can see it. I'm going to say now, as a prediction, if he stays, I think he's going to do well. I know, I know there's a lot of fans. I know there's a lot of supporters out there. I've read a lot of very critical comments, at least on Twitter. At least on Twitter, people are like, yeah. I can't believe Pisano's on this team. You know, Chris Henderson, you've got to get rid of him. Get Pozzolo back here. I mean, there, there you go. I'll, I'll finish it with that with a question. I won't even chime in here for both of you. Would you rather have Pozuelo or Pizarro? Let's say you could get them both for the exact same deal this year, right? You could keep one, but you and you can get you can you cannot have the other one. Who do you take if you need to win games and you, you give your the best chance of winning in twenty twenty three to have a successful season? Who are you taking? Pozuelo or Pizarro, Andrea? <laughs> mm. I can go first if you want. <laughs> you can clearly, go first. clearly, Andrea is having a hard time, you know, having to make up her mind there. And, and I already know why. But anyway, go ahead. Jose, you go first. Pos, Pizarro or Pozuelo? Pozuelo, 100%. Pozuelo, 100%. I would sign Pozuelo right now. Just because, you know, he proved last year what what he can do within this within field system. So, I mean, that's you don't need more than that. And, and Pizarro, he hasn't been able to perform, although... You know, I would agree with Andrea that this could be a good year for him because this is the last year in his contract. And if nobody wants to pick him up for 3.5, I'm sure he wants to turn that around and he wants to have several options next year. And for that, he needs to be good with Inter Miami. There's no other way to, to go. So, and, uh, but I, but yes, it's possible right now. Andrea, did you have an answer yet? <laughs> <laughs> I think it pains her to say Pozuelo. I think she wants to, like, you know, ride this Pizarro train and her Pizarro prediction, but it's hard for her to... to... Yeah. You got to call yeah, it like it is, Andrea. You said that at the of beginning course. of the show, so let's hear exactly. it. Come on. Yes, Pozuelo or Pizarro? It's difficult. Right now, Pozuelo would deserve, but but uh, unfortunately, the situation for the team is not that one. And, and I think... Pozuelo could have deserved if Inter Miami. No, 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 was no, 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 no. Sorry, 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 sorry. No, don't give me deserve. Don't give me deserve. I said, no, who would you pick? Who would you pick? Okay, so you would pick Pozuelo. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. I said I wouldn't say it, but I lied. All three of us. I would take Pozuelo if I could choose between. If I had to choose between Pozuelo, Pizarro, and they both were on similar deals, and I could, I could make it work in the MLS structure or the salary budget structure i'm taking pozuelo um but anyway all right let's move on because we've still got a few topics to talk about one of them we've talked about campana i don't think we need to go into too much more detail let's see what happens with him on thursday let's see if he's back from his his uh cold that we were told he had on monday i was told he trained on tuesday so let's see if on thursday he's there during the part of training that's open to the media because we're only getting i think 15 minutes on thursday so Let's see there. We'll, we'll, we'll leave the Campana nugget for later. As of now, he was just sick on Monday or had an illness. Uh, let's go into Joseph Martinez because the reports are ramping up. It's sounding more and more like the Venezuelan striker will be playing for Inter Miami in 2023. Now, how will it all come out? Well, according to The Athletic, Atlanta United is set to buy out Joseph Martinez out of his contract. That will leave him to be free to be picked up by Inter Miami, which will not have to use a DP slot on him. Inter Miami would only pick up, based on this reporting, would be only picking up a part, a part or a portion of his salary. So not a DP in 2023. And it looks like he is going to be joining the South Florida side. So there's a lot to dissect here, not only from a tactical standpoint, not only from a, a fit standpoint, not only from a health standpoint, there's a lot to to, to to get into here. Tactically, we'll wait for the official announcement before that before we get into that because otherwise this podcast is going to be two hours long. Let's go into what we think of the move, just for um, you know surface level. Him being an addition to Inter Miami on a non DP deal, as is being reported. Jose, start with you. Because you were ready, to, you were ready to go a few minutes, a few minutes ago. Yeah, I think it's a risky move 
I think it's a risky move, to be honest. I think, you know, it Why? can go. It, I think it can go very, very good if, you know, you get um, the Joseph Martinez that's available, that's, that stays away from injuries, and that, um, you know, it's a good, good personality for the locker room. And it could go really, really bad if, you know, um, he gets again into trouble with coaches, which is something that has happened to him in his career, not only at the club level, but also at the national um, uh, national team. Um, and um, But, you know, I think if you're Inter Miami and he's not a designated player, you are okay to take that chance because, remember, attendance is a problem as well. And, and I'm sure a lot of Venezuelans will enjoy watching Joseph Martinez in South Florida. So I think he's the type of player that if everything goes well, you know, he's a happy guy and happy to be to have everybody around. But if not, you know, it's it's complicated. So I think you take that risk if he's not a designated player. I think he's a player that Miami needs right now because you need goals after Iwain retiring last year. So I would put it at that risky. I agree. I think it's a big gamble. I think it's a big gamble because of all the things you t- just touched on. One. He's notably, notably slowed down in terms of his production since the initial knee injury in 2020. Suffered an ACL injury, and since then he hasn't exactly been the same player. Now, Phil Neville talked about Joseph Martinez and the feeling and the just the vibe he vibe he's gotten from Joseph Martinez from seeing him play as an opponent on the sidelines. And that, you know, he, he has that hunger to win and that 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 mentality and and just he called him a machine said it's something you might not be able to perceive when you're sitting in the stands or maybe us in the press box like you you don't get the sense for that human competitive aspect that you might be able to sense on the field although Andrea is a photographer and I know Andrea maybe has had a, a few more experiences in terms of maybe perceiving that now Phil Neville talked in more general terms when I asked him about you know, Joseph Martinez's run-ins with coaches, because like you said, Jose, there is a history of that, not only in Atlanta United, but with Venezuela as well. He had an incident, very public incident, with uh, Rafael Dudamel, led to the point where, where Joseph Martinez was saying, I will not play for the national team again until that coach is gone. He also had an issue with Gabriel Haynes at Atlanta United, where Haynes separated him from the team and had him doing individual training. And then this this past season with Gonzalo Pineda, uh, Opineda, excuse me, you know they had they had several run-ins, including one that led to Joseph Martinez being suspended for quote conduct detrimental to the team end quote. Let's very quickly listen to what Phil Neville said just overall about bringing in a, bringing in players who are big personalities. Let's take a listen. Yeah, well, I think, it, well, first and foremost, he's not our player. You know, we, we talk about bringing in players. Uh, I think I think what I'll do, I'll talk about the general in terms of sort of like how do we accept players into into our locker room. I think I think I said at the start of last season that we're not going to allow any kind of, uh, excuse the language, we're not going to allow any kind of dickheads in our, in our, in our dressing room. So I think, I think what I always say to people that always challenge me on that is say, well, do you know what, you know what, that person can do X, Y, Z. Leave the management of that player to me. That that's that's my job. That's what I'm paid to do. Uh, I think I think what what we've seen over the last two years is that that we've had to manage a lot of big personalities. And I think I think Gonzalo is a, is a prime example of getting the best out of someone that probably wasn't going right, and then finishing on such a high note. So so I think I I bite my ability to deal with any kind of player. Okay, Andrea. Do you agree with Jose? Do you agree with myself that it is a gamble for Inter Miami to go after Joseph Martinez? Or do you agree with Phil? Or are you, are you more in line with Phil's thinking in that, you know what, Phil Neville has shown that he can manage some difficult personalities. He, he was able to manage Higuain to some success there at the second half of the 2022 season. And he can do it again. He can replicate that with Joseph Martinez. What do you think? No, I agree with you guys. Uh, listen, Joseph Martinez has a lot of goals in MS um, that speaks for him, but in his personality and uh, all of the stories that you talked about, but also of what I've seen in the field with him, he is um, not nice. 
not nice. And <laughs> it's going to be very difficult for him to come to this locker room in Inter Miami because he will think that he is at the level at Iwain as Iwain was. And everyone respected Iwain, but Iwain had his career playing in Real Madrid and playing in Europe to back that up. And Joseph Martinez, yes, he has goals in MLS, he won titles, but he doesn't mm -hmm. command that respect that Iwain does. So I've seen Joseph Martinez close behaving like anything else that I, a, a good word to put it is a, a diva and being super disrespectful with people. So I don't, I don't, I personally don't think it, it would be a good fit for the locker room that Inter Miami has in this moment. But I, I understand the team. I understand, especially because what Phil said that they wanted players who had won in MLS. So I guess the easiest thing to bring is Joseph Martinez because Atlanta and Gonzalo Pineda don't want him. And Inter Miami needs someone who has experience in the league and they, they are betting on it being easy like it was with Pozuelo. But Pozuelo is a different type of person. Pozuelo is not arrogant. And I think Joseph Martinez is a little bit arrogant and a little bit um, disrespectful with people. So I will say this based on what you've just commented. Look, you don't have to be a nice person and you don't have to be a nice player on the field. Like that's not what you get paid to do. You get paid to produce, to score goals if you're a forward and to help your team win. If he can do that, Inter Miami will be more than happy, they'll be more than elated, and they will take that. And so will Inter Miami fans. Now, if all the extra stuff that comes with Joseph Martinez outshines what he does on the field, then I think you're entering the bad side of this gamble. Because you're banking on Joseph Martinez returning to the Joseph Martinez, like Jose just said, of a few years ago where he was scoring goals in bunches. Scoring goals... Like they were going out of style. That's what you're banking on if you're bringing Joseph Martinez. Because clearly his track record in recent years has shown that he can be problematic. And that he can be an issue in that locker room. And Inter Miami has worked very hard and very meticulously and very carefully and strategically to build a locker room since last year where the pieces all fit together, where the environment is jovial, where it's familial uh, by most accounts. So you could disrupt that by bringing in a player like Joseph Martinez. And you have to know that. Which is why I think when Phil Neville was giving that that comment, he said something along the lines of, you know, when people ask me about what player can do X, Y, Z, I tell them, let me manage it. Let me manage the player. That's what I get paid to do. I think that was Phil Neville sharing a conversation he's had with somebody maybe internally at Inter Miami uh, or something along those lines. Yeah, so that's that's how I took it, because it's absolutely a talking point. It, there's no way that that Chris Henderson and Phil Neville sat at that table to discuss this potential move, which again, by all accounts, it seems like it's going to happen, and that then this conversation did not come up. Like, look, you know, he's had his issues with coaches. He's had his issue with coaches. You know, is this something we we re are we sure we want to do this? They do have to get better. There's no denying that Inter Miami needs to be more ruthless in front of goal. I do have questions as to how that works with Campana and uh, Joseph Martinez if they're both on the roster. But again, we'll dive into that later on if and when this move officially gets announced. Let's just stick to the fit in the team and in the, in the locker room. I wrote something for the Substack, Miami Total Football Substack, today. In addition to that Gregory piece from earlier that I mentioned. In which this is, I think, like Jose said, a gamble. It's a, it's a maybe a necessary gamble that the team feels they have to take. Not only for, uh, you know, taking that next step on the field, but also maybe getting some more butts People. in the seats. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there is a very big, very large Venezuelan community here in South Florida. And Joseph Martinez is a goal-scoring striker. He's got some some flavor and some sass. And, he, you know, he, he could be a very marketable figure and, and someone that can help allure uh, some more fans into Dry Pig Stadium consistently. And, and to be fair... Um, you know, he's not a designated player anymore. Right, exactly. And I think that's a big part a of it. Anyway. I think that's a big part of it. I so, think, I think that know, makes it more worth the gamble. I think that makes it more worth taking the gamble. And I think we all need to understand what that means. The expectations around Joseph Martinez shouldn't be the ones of a designated player. So, you know, yeah, you can get all excited about what he did in the league in years past, but you know, injuries 
are part of the game. And unfortunately, you know, some players are able to work through them. But, you know, there are situations in which an injury can progressively limit your abilities. And, you know, it seems like that's the case for Joseph right now. Obviously, you know, coming to South Florida, weather situation as well, something that you have to think about. Um, it, that has affected some other players. Um, I don't know if that's a problem for Joseph because, you know, obviously in South America, uh, you know, there's similar weather to what we have here. But at this point in his career, that's something that you need to think about, you know, the management, how minutes are going to be, um, how is that going to take an effect into his performance level? So um, just I think we have to be patient and I don't think we'll be surprised if it goes really, really well, or if it goes really, really bad. I think we just know at this point that it's going to be, that it is a risky move, it's a gamble, and we'll see how it goes. I, I think it'll be something, this is not inside information, just my sensation from the outside. I think it'll be something like a one-year deal with team option for another one or two after that. You know, They can revisit it, maybe sign him as a DP, if he produces to that to that level. I think that they'll yeah, that would that they'll, they'll gauge him for this year and see how, how things all fit. Because, you know, Phil Noble said that... that you know, they want players that can demand that competitive nature in training, that can help provide that. And then um, that's obviously a good thing in, in within a team, so long as it stays there. You know, and there's some frustration that you could say is acceptable. But, you know, with what we've read and, and heard and, and the different things that has, ha- has happened with Joseph Martinez over his career, it's definitely, definitely a risky move. It's it's something that I think could either make this season or break this season. That that's how big of a gamble I think it is. I agree. Yeah, it could make Inter Miami season be very successful, where they finish in the top four in the Eastern Conference like they're looking for. Maybe make a deep run in the playoffs, or maybe make a run somewhere in these competitions. Or if it if it I... goes bad. Uh, or if it, it, it goes, goes bad, it we, could be we, nightmarishly. We feel fire. <laughs> well, it could be very. It could be nightmarishly problematic for for Inter Miami and and Phil Neville and just the overall. And I'm sure those questions will be asked if and when he is he is signed. But let's leave it there because we are starting to creep into that hour mark, and we still have to get to our Q and A session and our final thoughts. So we will leave you guys to chew on that. I know there's a lot of excitement about Joseph Martinez. We'll see how it all plays out. We'll see how it all plays out if and when he does sign. So let's take a quick break. We'll come back to do the Q&A and the final thoughts. We'll do that after this. Okay, listeners, so it's Q&A time. We got a lot of questions, a lot of inquiries from you guys, which we really, really appreciate. But since we're trying to be very, very strict in terms of keeping this pod shorter for you all, we can only answer a few. So if you don't get called upon, don't feel bad. Don't uh, don't be shy to ask questions going forward. We will get to them. We will get to you. We will not pick the same people over and over and over again. But we do, just for time's sake, have to just only pick a few at a time, given the amount of questions that we're getting. So let's start with Alphaverse. He says, With the signing of Joseph Martinez for a non-DP spot, should the club pursue Alexander Kayens from New York City FC? I think the center back is needed. So, very quickly, Alexander Kayens, or yeah, Kayens, is, uh, or Collins, is out of contract at New York City FC. He helped them win an MLS Cup. He's a center back, left-footed, plays for the Peruvian national team. Me personally, and it's not because I'm Peruvian, I do think that they need to go... I don't know if they need to go after him exactly, but I do think they, they need to upgrade the center back position. I think they need to find one center back there that can be a starter um, in addition to Damian Lowe or Christopher McVeigh. I don't think... If you want to take that next step, that Damian Lowe can be your number one center back option. I think there has to be someone uh, brought in that's better than him. If you can do that, and I do think Kyans is better than, than Damian Lowe, if you can do that, then I think you've upgraded that defense. 
If you don't, I I think they should do it if they want butts in the stadium. What better than a Peruvian guy, a Peruvian guy that plays in the national team? They should go for him. I would. Hey, if they brought him, great, excellent. I do think he's he's really good in MLS. He's proven in MLS, and, and he can do very well. But if it's not him, I still think they need to go out and get a center back. I agree with you know Alpha here that they need a center back regardless, regardless if it's Kyans or not. I think that they need to upgrade the center back position. So that's that's just my thoughts. Okay. Next question will come from Atlanta Herons. DP musical chairs seems to be on the agenda for all of preseason and probably into the regular season. Not buying that Campana is sick, by the way. Is this a case of maintaining as much flexibility as possible? Is it possible that Inter Miami 3 DPs have already worn the Rosa y Negra? Suerte. Jose, you're up. Oh my God, I hope not. I hope not because they really need some <laughs> firepower coming in from a, a designated player. Um, no, I don't think so. I think they'll find a way. I don't know. I think uh, Campana is eligible as a young designated player, isn't he? I think he's 22. He was. Who knows when they signed that contract? So, um, no, I think there's still, there's still room for one more. One more designated player will be coming in. Um, I don't know if they will do it uh, during preseason. I think they'll probably do it. Uh, during this summer. Okay. And let's go one more. Dos knows. If we do add Joseph Martinez, are we adding silverware this season? Do you see this team winning any of the cups or do we need to still upgrade the defense? So I already said, I think they need to upgrade the defense. I don't know what you guys think, but regardless, let's, let's answer the other ones. If Joseph Martinez is added, do they, does Inter Miami win some silverware this season? Do they win any of the competitions that they're in? I would say no. Andrea. Me too. In no, Joseph Martinez is not enough. I would also say no. No. They have a better chance to win silverware if things go well and according to plan, but I don't know if that necessarily puts them over the top. Uh which you know what? We'll do one last one. And it's a simple simple yes or no. Simple yes or no. Don Cafecito. Some signings aren't official yet, but are imminent or already done. And Pizarro seems to have a new lifeline. With this new squad, is it a top four caliber team in the East? Oh, no. No, 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 no. No way. I say not even close. Not yet. I agree. The teams that were uh, first, second, third, and fourth are still better than them. But Inter Miami didn't necessarily get, yeah, at least as until now, and it's early in preseason, there's still moves to be made hasn't got necessarily gotten better. They've lost a very big piece in Gonzalo Higuain and they have not really replaced him. So Yeah. I, I don't think I don't think I can answer the question yet. I don't think I can answer the question yet. But Jose, for you to say not even close after they finished sixth last year? Yeah, but they finished one or two points behind what, tenth or eleventh place as well? Oh, yeah. You, you mean no, ahead. Then you I, mean ahead. Yeah, ahead. Okay. No, 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 no. No not right not right now. I mean he thinks good change yeah I mean, and 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 i think that's that's a question that we can go back in in when preseason is over and then and i after watching preseason games i might have a better idea they might be a better team this year in terms of that's why know, i said chemistry. yeah i don't know if we can answer that question yet but you you just went in you went in as of right now no, no. <laughs> yeah in paper they are not better with with the players they have brought they are not better than Philadelphia Union, than uh, Montreal, than uh, New York, better. both New York. Yeah. I mean, I don't like to compare the teams right now at this point because we don't know exactly what the other yeah. teams will be like this year. But no, I don't think they, they have not done enough still in, in, in the Mercado for us to say like, oh, yes, they can go and compete with what Philadelphia has. They have not done enough you in the transfer I'm... market, is what Andrea said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to do one last one, just because I'm a man of the people, and let's get one more question in here. <clears throat> and it comes from Luis Mega. And this question is a little bit different. He says, Emerson, dot, 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 dot. If that guy develops, and along with the additions Inter Miami has, the team can become a tough side, creating a lot of headaches. What are the plans or updates for him? Does he fit in Neville's plans? Because he should. Oof. And I, I feel like I just entered uh, or I just opened Pandora's box because I, because I feel like you both have a lot bueno, to say here. Uh, but no, we have to go quick, succinct, short. Andrea, 
Does he fit into Phil Neville's plans in 2023, Emerson Rodriguez? Do you see that as being the case or not? Yes or no? Hopefully he does. If I see it, we will have to wait and see for at least the first game of preseason. I, I would say this. The real tournament for or real season for Emerson Rodriguez started on Monday and it ends one day before the start of a regular yeah. season. If he's able to compete for a starting spot within the next few weeks, mm-hmm. it's going to be a good year. If not, um, I think alone would be the best option for him. Yeah. I think with how busy the year is, because there's three competitions, U.S. Open Cup, there's the MLS regular season, playoffs if you make it, and the Leaks Cup, which will include all MLS teams this year, I think he will have his opportunities. He will have opportunities to make an impression. Whether he makes the best of them or not, that will be up to him, and that'll be up to the performances he puts forth. I think he'll have his chances. I don't know if he's looked at as a number one at any position right now, if he's seen as a starter, but he could be a spot starter. He should get his opportunities. It's about making the most of them because there are a lot, a lot of options, or as you know, there's pretty good amount of options for those winger spots. So we will see. All right, let's leave it there for the Q&A session. Very quickly, some final thoughts because there's still some other Inter Miami talking points we have not discussed. We will start with Jose. All right, final thought on Nico Stefanelli. I did my research on him. Um, He's listed. Who is that? Who is that? For the listeners, who is that? New signing. The new signing for Inter Miami. Argentine, I don't, I can't remember the age right now, but yeah, new signing for the team. So Stefanelli looks more, you know, um, like like a traditional number nine. Um, I, I've I've been able to watch some of the videos throughout his career, and um, he's he's good inside the box. You know, I thought initially the the stats didn't make any justice to what I saw on video. He he doesn't have a lot of goals, but I think he has some quality inside the box. I think he should be a good player for 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 Inter Miami. We'll see because you know one thing is what we see on video and then the other part of the story is where Phil thinks he could play. So that that's gonna play a factor. Hopefully there's not a Robert Taylor or Lewis Morgan situation and he finds the right place where he's comfortable and and he's able to be a good fit for this club. And Stefanelli is coming from AIK Football, a, a Swedish team. So Just don't look at the stats. Give him a chance. That's what I'm trying to say to people. <laughs> don't look at the Give stats. a chance to Coco, okay. too, then, if we're You're talking about this. giving chances to people that we don't know. Is he fit to play? <laughs> we should have asked if he was injured. Because... He trained. He trained. He looked, he looked, he looked fine. He looked fine. <laughs> no, he's it talking hurt. about Stefanelli. Jose? No, I was talking about Coco. Oh, Coco. Yeah, no, he good. He uh, good. Well, that, so we'll see. We'll see. He's coming over from Sweden. We'll see how he fits into the overall equation. I think, I mean, I don't, again, not inside information, just based on perce- my perception, I think you see him play as, I don't think you see him play as an out and out nine. I think you'll see him either play as a 10, uh, maybe, uh, you know, under underneath the striker, not necessarily with the same, you know, uh, function as a 10. Maybe different type of responsibilities, like right? Well, he, he could play. Right he could play more of like a. Look. Correct. That's what I'm saying. Maybe you see him, you know, playing uh, off the number nine. Maybe he's playing as a as a secondary striker or a shadow striker. However, you you like to coin the phrase. I see him playing. I could see him playing something like that. Maybe because if you have Joseph Martinez, you have Leonardo Campana, you have Corinthians. John, are you really going to have another player playing striker up there? I mean, maybe, but. I don't think that's going to be his his prefer, or not his preferred spot. Sorry, the the spot that Phil Neville prefers to deploy him in. I, that's just again my outside perspective. Andrea, your final thoughts.
And that's Darren Powell and Javier Morales that are moving up to the first team as assistants. And that's Federico Higuain that's taking over as head coach of Inter Miami 2. So he's replacing Darren Powell in that capacity. My final thought is on Robbie Robinson and well and Ariel Lasseter. The two of them also spoke to us on Monday. Robbie Robinson went into his injury uh, riddled career and how difficult it's been for him, but how eager he is to get going. He knows it's an important year for him. Phil Neville also said that. Phil Neville even, I think he went a little bit uh, above and beyond there with the praise, but he was saying that you know, Robbie Robin has the potential to be a number nine for the U.S. men's national team, a position that Phil Neville thinks, you know, was the one that was that needed to be uh, improved on during the World Cup. Um, so it's a big year for Robbie Robinson. I think this year will really tell us if he's going to be uh, a bust in terms of a first-round draft pick or if he's going to start making good on the potential he has. And I've already said I think he's leaning towards more towards bust than... Uh, uh, you know, a, a big impact player for this team. I think he's pretty close to, you know, having earned that label as bust if he hasn't already. But this year will will give us more information as to that. As for Ariel Lasseter, he said he's been working on finishing uh, finishing drills and trying to be more calm and composed inside the box. He wants to add more, more goals to his game. Wouldn't give us the number that he's looking to hit uh, in terms of goals for this season, but he definitely has one there. And he's going to try to hit that. You know, he said he's training with his father, Roy, the former great player who, uh, you know, is no stranger to scoring goals. So we'll see how both of them do. Those are two players that will be competing with the likes of Emerson Rodriguez, Corantan Jean, um, you know, for, for playing time. So a lot of, lot of options there, a lot of attacking options um, with more potentially coming. So anyway, that does it for this week's episode. It was a jam-packed episode, and I think we just went over the amount of time that we wanted to so apologies for that we will continue to work to get better on that this is our preseason as well so for jose armando for andrea yanis i am franco penizo you have been listening to miami total football radio